Warning. You've reached on the box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to another stupefying edition of On the Box with Ray Comfort. Today we're going to be talking about where Cain got his wife. Taking it easy in the easy chair, I am the easygoing sidekick. Sitting at the dean's desk is the urbane Mark Spence. And this is the one, the only, the guileless Ray Comfort. Without guile. Stupendous. Now, if there's anyone still with us today after yesterday's debacle, we would be pleasantly surprised. But we had fun. I mean, those things happen. It yeah, keeps us humble. Yeah, it's a fallen creation. Right. You know, it, it wasn't is. perfect. We are really excited to tackle uh, the main question of the day today, as I know that it's burning in many of your hearts and minds. But before we get to that, uh, we want to talk about a very important news item that uh, has me scratching my head. And I'm sure uh, it uh, will do the same for you after you hear it. This is from the BBC. A woman who aborted her own baby in the final phase of her pregnancy has been jailed for eight years. Sarah Louise Cat, 35, of Sherborne and Elmet, North, North uh, Yorkshire, took a drug when she was full term, 39 weeks pregnant, to cause an early delivery. She claimed the boy was stillborn and that she buried his body, but no evidence of the child was ever found. Cat made a deliberate and calculated decision to end her pregnancy, a Leeds Crown Court judge said. Cat, who already had two children with her husband, had a scan at 30 weeks confirming her pregnancy at a hospital in Leeds, the court heard. Cat had been having an affair with a work colleague for seven years, the judge was told. Mr. Justice Cook said Cat had robbed the baby of the life it was about to have and said the seriousness of the crime lay between manslaughter and murder. Cat had proved to be more than capable of being extremely deceitful in her actions, said uh, Inspector Smith. Cat has proved to be cold and calculating and has shown no remorse or given any explanation for what she did. Uh, Ray, uh, what type of bizarre double standard contradiction is this? Seriously. It, 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 it angers me. It frustrates me. Uh, it makes me think it's kind of like someone not being a member of the Nazi party, getting into a firing squad, shooting Jews. They find out they're not a member of the Nazi party, so they prosecute them for murder because wow. they weren't a Nazi. That is a great analogy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, here's a lady who uh, aborted her own baby, and we know that abortion is fully legal in the UK, mm -hmm. and she's now on trial for murder, but women can go into a doctor's office and do it by the thousands or millions around the world every day, and yeah. it's no big deal. You've got to get done, got to have a professional murderer, a hitman to do it for you. Wow. Then it's okay. Mark, do you find that uh, as perplexing as we do? Oh, boy, it's, it's inconsistent, to say the least. You know, if you're going to stay consistent within your logic, well, then you need to grab a hold of your logic and bring it to its reasonable and logical conclusion. This is something that should have made the news big time, but it declares the inconsistency of the pro-choice worldview. Right. Absolutely. And we're encouraged, though. You know, we have brothers and sisters that are out there on the front lines uh, fighting. We mentioned uh, recently the brother who gave the in the womb tract. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Remember that? that? Wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a couple of ladies decided not to abort their baby. And previous to that, actually, the lady uh, who had come with her friend actually brought her friend so that she wouldn't abort because she had come before. They gave her a tract. She went and gave it to her friend inside, and she didn't abort. So three babies saved. And that brother is in Florida, if I remember rightly. Um, is there every day at abortion clinics trying to talk people out of killing the babies and he's dropped every other track to use the in the womb right. track which is just wonderful very very encouraging so keep up the fight look it doesn't make sense because it's completely unreasonable and illogical but uh, the world in which we live is a fallen creation so man's going to do whatever uh, he can to um, fulfill his own uh, wicked desires right. so god have mercy all right evidence bible quote of the day Joseph, who was to be only a servant to Pharaoh, was preferred at 30 years old. 
But Moses, who was to be a god to Pharaoh, was not so dignified till he was 80 years old. It is fit he should long wait for such an honor and be long in preparing for such a service. So, Ray, you've been preaching... Uh, that was John Wesley. Yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Love John Wesley. He was short, you know. How do you know? That says it in, in, in his autobiography. Do you believe everything you read, Ray? I do. He, he, he <laughs> fell short of the glory of God. He was short. He was last to know when it rains, and he <laughs> needed to stand on things when he opened and preached. Yeah. I love that. I've heard you say that for years, the last to find out when it rains. Yeah, yeah, short people. That's a benefit you for short people. Big ones get hit first. Uh-huh. Uh, but, but, you know... Um, this is profound, and as Mark reminded us yesterday, you've been preaching for ages and ages. So <laughs> <laughs> through the ages, oh, through the that's ages, right. that's what through it was. Through the ages, since, through uh, the ages, since BC. Um, but but I think the implication here is that you know sometimes it takes those years of seasoning to be used by the Lord in extraordinary oh, ways. Oh, absolutely. And I just love both Moses and Joseph are a type of Christ. And when you look mm. at the type of Christ for Joseph, uh, it's just wonderful. You know, his brothers forsook him. He dropped in a well. He's probably there for three days, I don't know, three nights, I don't know, and then resurrected and, uh, as a slave and then sat on Pharaoh's right hand. It's just a wonderful. And then revealed himself to his brothers, to his brethren. It's just an incredible story. Yeah. But yeah, Moses had uh, 40 years of looking after sheep. Oh, he boy. was a pastor looking after dumb uh, sheep for 40 years. Yeah, talk uh, about patience. I had three years of looking out, three and a half years of looking after sheep, the time of tribulation as a, an assistant pastor years ago. <laughs> and it is a wilderness experience. It's a time of breaking and making you meek right. and uh, a wonderful preparation for itinerant ministry. But uh, yeah, everyone who wants to be used by God is going to be broken by God first, it would seem. Right. Uh, someone said that. And, and Mark, <laughs> as far as the, the patience element, you know, we often don't think about how long it took um, Moses before he was used by the Lord. And maybe you can share some encouragement for those out there that, you know, sense a call from God or maybe even have been out evangelizing, preaching the gospel, but they don't, they don't see the results or the fruit either in their own time or in the way they want to see it. How would you encourage them for Moses' line? You know, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that he makes all things beautiful in his timing. And that's the key. It's his timing. You know, we are to be still, know that he's God. We, uh, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings as eagles. They're not going to grow weary. They're not going to grow tired. They're going to do what God wants them to do. In that meantime, in that interim, what do you do? It doesn't mean you sit on your hands. It means you serve the Lord patiently and continually. You know, I hear it said, hey, I don't know if I should go to college, if I should just pick up a job, what, what do I do? And an analogy I heard one time was really simple. Look at a semi-truck, for example. Is it easier to steer a semi-truck that is moving or one that is staying still? Hmm. Well, it's one that is moving, obviously. It obviously doesn't matter how big the semi-truck is or how much weight is inside that truck. As long as it's moving forward, it's easy to steer. And that's what we need to do. As we sit with the Lord, we're really moving forward. We're studying to show ourselves approved. We're out on the street evangelizing. We're doing the things we know that we are supposed to do. And when you're doing things you know what you're supposed to do, you'll know the things that you're supposed to be doing. Right. So uh, you go, well, when's God going to open up ministry? Well, we're all in the ministry. We're all missionaries. I think it was Spurgeon who said you're either a missionary or an imposter. So move forward by sharing your faith, by studying, by loving on the people around you, by becoming equipped. And in God's timing, you will be exactly at the place where God wants you to be. And it's been, it's been said that God is seldom early, but he's never late. Mm -hmm. He's always on time with his timetable. Right. Well, I love the analogy of uh, not being able to turn the wheel of a truck when yeah. it's not moving. Um, have you ever tried to do that without power steering? Uh, That's people down through the back ages. Back in the day, yeah. Down through the ages, I remember before the uh, time of power steering. That, <laughs> we take it for granted, uh, don't we? Seriously. Oh, there's so many things that have, that have changed in recent yeah. years and typewriters. And, yeah, that's great. Mark, that was a really good point uh, that you made as well. Uh, you know, oftentimes we quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but we typically skip over verse 10, which says, and he prepared, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, hmm. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, and, you know, Second Timothy talks about uh, being a vessel for honor, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So if we look at it from that vantage point, God has prepared our works beforehand. When we're walking in uprightness, he says that whoever cleanses himself from the latter, in the context of speaking of a, of a host of iniquities and sins, 
he will be a vessel for honor, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So if you walk in uprightness and righteousness, you're prepared for every good work that God has prepared for you. And as you lock, walk along the road of life, abiding in Christ, God is going to bring those uh, two into union and, and they're going to intersect and you're going to bear fruit and glorify God. So be patient, uh, especially for maybe single people out there uh, who aren't married, that, that you, know, you feel antsy, maybe you're, you're getting up in age. Listen, Use your singleness for the Lord. Trust him. Those of you that have lost jobs, those of you that are struggling and battling with sickness or, or with family problems, don't give up. Continue to press on in Christ. And I'm speaking to Christians and trust the Lord uh, and persevere. Think of all the difficulties Moses went through in the wilderness. So I hope that encourages you. All right, Mark, the tool of the day. All right, so we have tons and tons and tons of gospel tracks that have been accumulated down through the ages by Ray. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the gospel tracks that Ray came up with that is actually very creative, it has a 10-minute getaway time once you hand the track out to the individual and then you get away because it takes 10 minutes before they realize it's even a track. It is this track right here. On the front it says, if at first you don't succeed at skydiving, well, if at first you don't succeed, don't try <laughs> skydiving rather. There you go, messing up at sentences. But it's 101 of the world's funniest one Mark, liners. can you give us some examples? Yeah, 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 yeah. Read, read some from in there, Mark. Just read the good ones. <laughs> um, sure. Well, why is abbreviation such a long word? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, always remember that you're unique, just like everyone else. But it, there's 101 of these. We need some canned laughter, uh, uh, right. Yes, exactly. But in the middle of it, there is a very clear and concise gospel presentation that is preceded by the law, which brings the knowledge of sin, obviously. But people appreciate this, uh, Christians and non-Christians alike. They don't tend to throw this away, even if they're an atheist, because there are some really good one-liners in there. For example, ask me about my vow of silence. I mean, that's just <laughs> silliness, right? It's just silliness, which is attached to right typically. Um, uh, but uh, the gospel is great. And it says at the very end, hey, make sure you don't read. Uh, forget about the editorial, which is found inside. And that's found at our website, livingwaters.com. And you can right. say, uh, yeah, following the elections, you'll enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> we right. need this. Yeah, it's a great tract, and uh, people enjoy it. They'll keep it. They'll uh, show it to others. And most importantly, because of that, They'll get the gospel and still have it with them. All right, to the main question at hand. Ray, I can only imagine uh, that you've been asked this a uh, few times. And I think that uh, atheists especially find great delight because they think this is the gotcha question for Christians. And I'll have something to say and follow up to that. But, uh, but this question, where did Cain get his wife, uh, is one that has been asked time and time and time and time again, and when we go back to even the Scopes trial, back in, in 1925, you had uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan, who was put on the stand and grilled, mm. and uh, boy, was he a bad representative for Christianity. I mean, even since You're then... You're talking about the Hollywood movie, or actually what happened in history? What happened in history. Okay. And I'm talking about the ripple effect from that, and yeah. that the answers that he gave were... Uh, were tragic and sad because oh. we do have an answer to that, but it seems like we didn't. He so, didn't have the evidence Bible. That was that's problem. the problem. <laughs> See there, Mr. Brian? Okay, so Ray, uh, you've been asked this before. How do you answer people that ask the question? Where did Cain get his wife? Where did Cain get his wife? ChristianSingles.com. <laughs> <laughs> E-Harmony. E -harmony. We're going to get sued by... Uh, yeah, I would tell you if I was able. <laughs> that's another uh, one. <laughs> you got to squeeze a squirrel, Ray, when you yeah, make so, it Yeah, uh, like so if you're, if you're a skeptic that's watching this, you are asking, where did Cain get his wife? And it's important to you. God's offering everlasting life, so why are you worried about where some guy got his wife from? <laughs> you don't even know Cain, and you say, no. Uh, Cain married a distant sister. And if you're married or you get married, you're going to marry a distant sister. Someone from the human family who is a distant sister. Even if you're an evolutionist, I think you'd believe that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, obviously, uh, there was not another human race that was created, as some would purport, that, hey, maybe there were other humans created, and they came, and they met, and so forth. But it's really simple. Um, yes, brothers and sisters were permitted to uh, marry at the beginning of creation. We know that that's what took place. And they were dis probably distant. Could have been distant. Yeah. Could have been, you know, immediate. You're right. But it could have been a, a, a relative, uh, you know, or it could have been a sister. You've got to remember what God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. If you put two rabbits together, what do you get? Right. Lots of rabbits. And yeah. God told Adam and Eve to have lots of rabbits. You having problems with rabbits? No, no problems with <laughs> rabbits these days. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that people don't realize is Adam and Eve, Adam at least we know, lived 930 years. 
And, uh, you know, and, and it talks about even after Seth, he was 800 years old, and it says he had sons and daughters. So mm -hmm. for, for all those years, Adam and Eve were having children. And yes, it was permissible uh, at that time. But we know then in Leviticus 18, after 2,500 years of the gene pool uh, being contaminated because mm -hmm. of the fallen sin, uh, God forbade it strictly. And so incest uh, was outlawed. But uh, I want to comment about uh, evolutionists in a minute. But Mark, uh, do you see a problem uh, w with that in terms of uh, people uh, being afraid of that as Christians to answer that question when we have the biblical account? Yeah, I, I mean, I can see people shy away from it, but it, it's actually quite simple when you begin to think about it. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know about God, uh, history, and so forth. It tells us everything we need to know about God and everything we need to know to live a life godly in Christ Jesus. Remember, the Gospel of John tells us that there, if all the accounts of Jesus were laid out, then there's not enough books in really the universe to hold all the stories together. But these things were written so that you may know and believe that Jesus is the son of the living God. That's why the gospel of John was written. But notice that many more books could have been written to describe all the things that Jesus did. So why didn't the Bible go off on a little tangent and tell us exactly who was married to whom? Because it's irrelevant. Hmm. All of the Bible points to God. It points back to Jesus Christ. If there was an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, it was a Christophany or a Theophany, an appearance of God. And those are laid out. Now, undoubtedly, there might have been more appearances. Why don't we talk about those? Because they're irrelevant to what God was trying to do. The Bible is a love story. It's history. His story is dealing with mankind. So everything we need to know is found within Scripture. Now, if somebody were to ask me this question, I'm out on the street. Where, where did King get his wife? I would say, why do you ask? Hmm. You know, we can't assume that they're trying to uh, paint you into a corner. They may just be wondering, hey, well, where did King get his wife? I could simply answer the question. I don't need to get offensive or defensive on it at all. Why do you ask? Right. A lot of times when people ask questions out on the street, I respond with, why do you ask? Based upon their response will determine on how I answer the question. If they are defensive themselves and they want to put me on the defense and they want to go off on what the Bible says, I won't even answer the question. I will begin to challenge their worldview. Mm. Is incest wrong? If they were to chime up, well, yes, it's, why is it wrong? Right. You know, in fact, there was a director less than a month ago, the director of Notebook, the movie that came out, that romance movie, who said, there's nothing more natural than incest. Right. A brother and a sister marrying each other. What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. If they don't have any kids, then there's no problems. And then he compared it to the homosexual uh, agenda with marriage. You know, mm -hmm. We say that two, two guys can get married. Why can't we say a brother and sister can get married? And he was consistent within his worldview. I give him props on that. But he didn't bring it to its logical conclusion. So back over to this. What do I say when somebody says the question, where did King get his wife? Why do you ask? And then... I will just allow them to talk. I'm slow to speak, even in the midst. Even though I might have an answer and a good answer for what they're asking, I want to get to the heart of the matter and get to the conscience. Right. That's a great point, Mark. And, you know, we, uh, we often don't lead people to the place where they take things to their logical conclusion. And, uh, and that's a great point. And the mm -hmm. question is, is what's your authority? What do you base that on? And are you implying that it's wrong? And right. if so, why? Uh, you know, I was talking to our good friend Carl Kirby this morning, mm. and he brought up a really good point. He said... You know, how come evolution uh, doesn't uh, talk about, uh, you know, its problem with the issue? Hmm. In that, uh, first of all, how, how did people procreate at the beginning, right? First of all, you had to have the, mir you had to have the miracle of uh, a man and woman, first of all, evolving, then having corresponding, um, you know, anatomies, and then uh, knowing how to uh, you join themselves together, and then having a child. Well, okay, then what about the next child? Well, you know, who did that child that's yeah, a good point. And then if not, oh, the other 20s. miracle. <laughs> right. Or the other miracle. Then another man and another woman had to evolve if incest wasn't taking place. And then they had to have a child. And those, I mean, it's just absolutely preposterous. But uh, those, those things are never brought to light and never examined and talked right. about. So the bottom line is, is that there is no problem to answering that question. It's simple. At that time, uh, relatives or siblings were permitted uh, to be joined in marriage. After the gene pool was contaminated 2,500 years later in Leviticus 18, God gave his command that it was forbidden, and that's that. And uh, there you have it. So there. There you go. All right.
Now we're going to cut away to a wonderful, delightful, joyful picture of Ray Comfort doing something that seems extremely bizarre. Do we have that photo, guys? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? Are those new shoes you got there, Ray? Those nice white sneakers. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the red and the green shoes, the big oh, ones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about platform shoes. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that, Ray. I was preaching up in here in, uh, in Times Square, and the police arrived just after the 911 um, tragedy, and they didn't have anything better to do, so they said I wasn't allowed to stand on a soapbox to preach. And I, with my smart mouth, said, can I stand in it? And one of them touched, I think he touched his gun, or I imagine that. So I, so I said, okay, okay, I won't stand on a box. And so a couple of guys come up and said, stand on us. So there we are. They, wow. They bent down, and I, was like, I got on their backs and uh, preached to the crowd. Is that Bart McCurdy there on the right? Uh, I think, I think it Bart. is. It looks yeah. like Bart. Bart. And I don't know who the other Bartholl guy is, but, uh, but God bless them. It really isn't easy to stand on And who's that very young-looking... I know why you did this. I know. To look taller than Todd Friel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the action. Our motive, freakishly please. tall friend. Boy, Todd looks young. Was this like 30, 40 years ago? It right? was down through the ages. Down you know, the it's ages. almost an optical illusion if you look at it. Your back foot looks like it's actually standing on the cement fence thing, whatever oh, it is. Oh, you're right. Look at that. But, uh, Ginormous a, Ray. But miracle. notice that the, the smaller guy's getting the blunt of Ray's 103-pound weight. <laughs> and not only that, it's a good advertisement for Pontiac. Look at that. <laughs> right. uh, should send it that's to what him. it is. And Todd's wearing my shirt right there, by the way. He is? Oh, is that your shirt? We needed a solid shirt to film him. Wait, that's the one you gave me, Mark, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so I was sure. What do you know? It's made its rounds. That was great. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to go uh, move on to a video that we've been wanting to show you. But again, time always runs short here because we have so much to talk about. But this is a uh, video uh, that was taken outside of an abortion clinic. So, guys, if we have that, let's please roll it now. Hey, everybody. It's Ross. It's Saturday morning early. Come out at 6 o'clock to the abortion clinic. It's... The Atlanta Holocaust. It's a sad place, a dark place. But we as Christians want to make sure that we bring the light of the Lord to a very dark place, making sure that these women and their mothers and the, the men know that there's options and alternatives to aborting their baby. And to make this point clear, we brought a track, if you will, that we purchased from Living Waters of a 12-week-old baby that would be in the womb of a mother. It's very graphic, but it really tells a good story to someone that says it's a fetus and not a baby. It has DNA at the point of conception. So here's the question. Would you go up to a mother that's pregnant and hit her very hard in the stomach? You would not. It would be assault. So what's wrong with this picture that people are aborting their babies when there's people that want babies? We're out here with love and compassion. We're hoping for conversations, and we'll get some today. This is a very graphic illustration. So come out, support the ministry. If you're indifferent and you're a Christian, and you said, that's not for me, or I haven't made a decision, you may be saying you're a Christian, and you may be pro-choice. You can't be pro-choice and be a Christian because life starts at conception. So we want to help you. If you're there, we want to talk to you as well. And if you want to get involved in the ministry here on Saturday morning and talk to women and men about the options to abortion, we're going to invite you. So come out, support the ministry. The womb should be the safest place on the face of the earth and in Atlanta. The mother's womb is not a safe place. It's a sad, sad day. But we want to put some light and some hope that we can save one life at a time. So come on out and see us. Make sure you look at the movie, 180movie.com, produced by Living Waters. It will change your life. 33 minutes long, 180movie.com. It changed a lot of the way I think about abortion in America. You know, there's 17,000 abortions in Atlanta every year. That's just Atlanta. So we want to do our best to reach out to souls, to evangelize them, to reach out with love and compassion as Jesus might do. So take care. God bless you. And always remember, do what you can, where you can, when you can, the very best you can. And God will never let you down. Go to the website, rtgm.com.
O-R-G. Take care. Hope to see you down the road. Hey, what, oh. a, what a nice guy. What a, he's a colorful character, actually. And he's stuck needgod.com billboards all over Atlanta. Yeah. In fact, just this morning, Ross sent us uh, some photos of uh, the billboards that have gone up. Mm. And one of them in particular was ginormous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really big. Mm -hmm. And he sent one in the daytime uh, that stood out, but then he sent it at night with lights on it. And it was just blaring. I thought, Lord, thank you. Yeah, you know, all the people that are going there. And by the way, if you want to contribute to that, uh, you can. Email us here at Living Waters and uh, note that you're interested to know how you can help to fund uh, Need God billboards in Atlanta. And I'll get you in contact with or Ross. 180. Billboards right, or too. 180 billboards. Yeah, Ross is asking about how we can get that done. But that just so excites me to see a brother out there, yeah. you know, reaching out and uh, standing in the gap to uh, allow the Lord to step in and save babies and God save souls. Him. So mm -hmm. um, please, friends, again, get out there and be sure to take a stand. We talked about my daughters recently, uh, 14 and 15, mm. and they were her horrified, terrified to share the gospel, but they decided to step out of their comfort zone and to do it, and we see what's happening. We talked about Scotty yesterday uh, and about how Scotty used to just come and watch, uh, and then he ended up getting out there and preaching the gospel. He made the mistake of saying to himself, I can't do this. Right. Mark, Spence, myself, uh, we started going out with you thinking, oh, this is something we could never do. But when you're around the atmosphere, uh, when you're surrounded by it, you see that example, mm -hmm. it stirs you on and you get to that place where, where you're inspired to step out. And that's why Living Waters is here. We want to remind you, our ministry exists to inspire and equip Christians to fulfill the Great Commission. That's the purpose uh, for everything that we do. And so make sure to go to livingwaters.com and check out our website and our resources uh, and our training material so that we can help you do that. Tomorrow, we're going to continue talking about Jehovah's Witnesses and to teach you how to reach out to them. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. For questions about On the Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's onthebox at livingwaters.com. On the Box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel.